Uh, one obvious lesson from the pandemic this year, um, I think, has been the extraordinary reliance that we've all had on uh, or our connectivity and on our broadband connections uh, in order to keep working and communicating with our friends and our family uh, through what has been a pretty tough year, uh, both as individuals uh, and also as businesses um, to allow us to keep on operating through the crisis while millions of people uh, work from home. So our next session is focused on uh, connectivity and on uh, both the fibre broadband and the new ultra-fast 5G networks uh, which are now being rolled out uh, across the UK and globally. Um, the wires and cables and telecom masks on which we rely took on a new and extraordinary importance uh, as our link to the outside world this year. And I think it's fair to say uh, the pandemic has also added a fresh urgency to the rollout of, of new infrastructure. Um, so universal access to fibre and 5G promises to deliver many things. Um, and it's going to be vital to ensuring that the UK remains competitive as we leave the European Union. So I'm joined here by two of the key players in this industry, uh, by Clive Selly, uh, the Chief Executive of Openreach, uh, the BT-owned operator of what is really the backbone of Britain's broadband network. Uh, welcome, welcome, Clive. Uh, Openreach employs 32,000 people across the UK and supports more than 620 communications providers to connect 30 million uh, customers. And also by Cormac Whelan, the Chief Executive of Nokia UK, who is a key figure in the rollout of 5G telecom networks in this country. Uh, Cormac uh, formerly worked for Alcatel Lucent and prior to that, in fact, BT, so he's a former colleague of, of, of Clive's, uh, and is an executive who's worked all over the world in the USA, in France, uh, Belgium and the Czech Republic and elsewhere. Um, Clive, if I can turn to you first, I think we last spoke uh, in January, um, just a little bit after the election and, and just a few weeks really before the pandemic hit, but it really feels like a, an age ago. Um, and it was just a few weeks before Openreach was really sort of thrust into centre stage of this battle to keep Britain uh, connected and online. Uh, and back then there was a lot of concern right at the start of lockdown that uh, you know, the network might not be able to cope uh, with this huge surge in home working and internet traffic. So I just wanted to start by asking what that was like um, and how you responded both as an organisation and as a leader with this sort of unexpected surge in, in demand as Britain went into lockdown. Well, good morning, Robin. Um, I think the networks, the six networks of open reach um, have performed very well, actually, um, in general during lockdown. Um, so we've had an experience, massive surge and massive new spikes in, in usage um, as the population of the offices of the UK have all moved to uh, uh, work from the, uh, from the back bedroom. So in general, the network performed really well. Um, we have 15 million homes connected now to our super fast broadband platform. That's a hybrid fibre copper platform. Um, and and that, that works for your work from home, for your online study, your online entertainment, etc. Um, for the staff of OpenReach, um, really proud with the way they reacted. Um, the field engineering teams have been out in the field, um, not just uh, supporting customer service through providing new services and fixing broken services, but also in continuing the acceleration of the fibre to the premise build. Um, we're now building at the rate of half a million homes passed per quarter. Um, you know, they have had to take on new processes Robin, um, new safety processes. So they're all equipped with masks and sanitizer and, uh, and new techniques for minimizing the time they spend in customer homes, doing more work in the external network and, and preparing um, you know, at the van before they enter the customer premises. That's to keep them safe uh, and to keep the, the, the customer safe. Um, and we've done a huge amount for uh, the NHS and other critical services during the period as well. So um, you know, we were in the background um, putting fiber, big fiber pipes into 17 Nightingale hospitals. Um, we've delivered fiber connections to literally hundreds of doctors, um, to people who are engaged in 
producing ventilators and, and people doing pharmaceuticals uh, R and D. Um, so we've kind of been in the background, but our product is in the foreground. You know, great broadband, uh, consistent uh, broadband. Uh, you know, that's that's our that's our stock in trade, and I think uh, very proud of what the team have done over the COVID period. And um, the pandemic wasn't the only uh, thing that uh, your, some of your engineers were having to deal with, because at one stage, uh, some of these engineers were actually facing physical assault from members of the public over some of these conspiracy theories that were flying around about um, that's right. telecoms infrastructure. Yeah, no, that's right. This this whole thing about 5G causes COVID, um, you know, on one level, it's just funny. On another level, it's threatening and dangerous. One of my engineers had five stab wounds um, from somebody um, who, uh, you know, was was a conspiracy theorist uh, activist, if you like. You know, somebody who genuinely thinks telecommunication systems cause COVID. Um, there, you know, the mobile companies in the UK will will tell you about masts being burnt and radio systems being burnt. Um, it's very scary for our field engineering teams. Uh, they were being spat at uh, during COVID, and of course, that's a way of transmitting COVID. Um, and and uh, lots and lots of incidents of verbal abuse. It's it's really sad, and it's really disgraceful. Um, so we've collaborated with uh, government and with the police. Uh, to try and track down some of these people and dissuade people through news items um, in, in national media. Sure. sure. Um, Cormac, if I can just turn to you now. Um, we've heard a great deal about the rollout of, of 5G and how important it is to uh, UK business. Can you just talk a little bit about why this is such a critical technology and what it means for UK PLC? Sure, good morning. Um, First of all, I'd like to echo what Clive has, has said in terms of um, the conspiracy theory issue and the behavior that's been going on. It's always very strange in, in stressful times what people will turn to in terms of belief or in terms of looking for a, an outlet for, for their concerns. And it's been terrible across all of our industry. Um, Clive's engineers, I know of my engineers, have been the same thing on sites and so on. So uh, I think it's important that, um, that steady heads remain and that we continue to inform people and educate people about, about what really is going on and so on. Um, uh, by the way, I would also say that the government and the police force have reacted very well to this in terms of making sure that these cases are followed up on and so on. Uh, otherwise, I think these things could have got more, more out of hand. But in terms of the 5G rollout and technology itself, I um, totally agree with what Clive said in terms of the, the broadband capability and the network that we have in rolling that out. And then we have on top of that this next generation of technology that is now hitting us in terms of um, operators now adopting for next-gen technology in their mobile networks, um, that also means they have to back up in terms of their transmission networks and in terms of their broadband networks, how that's going to, to interact and interface. But we're still at the early phase of this next generation of rollout. But the reason it's important is every generation brings with it certain things we know and love as consumers and as users, which is higher speed, higher capacity, and that's fine. And as we bring out new phones with higher density video capability, you need higher density networks to transmit up and down those videos. And again, that is the usual consumer use we see from generation to generation of, of mobile technology. But we're gonna see a seismic shift in the usage and capabilities and applications for business with 5G technology as it rolls out. In particular, we're gonna see a real benefit to industry and enterprise, the promise of industry 4.0 coming along. What does that mean? Really, it means machine-to-machine -machine communication, increased, hugely increased volumes of data as machines talk to machines and pass interactive data between them and make real-time decision-making. Real-time decision-making requires real-time network connectivity. And 5G will bring us a, a more than tenfold increase in the latency, uh, which is the end-to-end the -end speed of turnaround from data from one end to the other and back again, which you need for machines to talk to each other because we will start to see machines and industries and robotics and analytics make decisions in the core and on the edge of the network using this new technology which allows them to interact much quicker. Is it gonna affect us today? Well, we're already seeing some things start to happen. We're seeing great interest in private wireless networks, uh, but I think the, the mass rollout of this, as with any network, will take time. It's not that simple to roll out on average 16 to 17,000 sites for every operator 
um, to get this thing rolled out. Uh, but it is coming, it is here now, and is rolling out at, at pace. And um, we hear a lot about, um, you know, China, for example, putting in thousands of base stations a week, et cetera, and South Korea, uh, the United States. Where does the UK sort of sit in terms of um, the, the pace of this rollout and the, you know, uh, how do we compete, I suppose? I mean, because a lot of this is, is going to be, you know, that there are concerns that the UK could end up, end up being a laggard with uh, its digital infrastructure, and that could be very damaging for business. I mean, where, where, do, where do we sit compared to our, our, uh, our rivals? Uh, I, I think there's no doubt that historically the UK has been way ahead of the world when it was in voice technology and corporate technology and then in the hybrid technologies that Clive referred to earlier. But I think we have been a little bit slow, a little bit late in getting ourselves to uh, a full fibre mentality, um, which requires uh, a commitment from government, from operators, from technology vendors and from, from capital investment companies, which we are now seeing. I also think we've got to be careful the countries we compare it with. The, the early adopters of certain technologies like full fiber where government controlled states or government owned bodies um, where the decision making was easier, the funding was easier on a more nationalist type basis. Um, we have a very, very competitive comms infrastructure here in terms of copper, in terms of fiber, in terms of mobile. Um, and so it takes a, a Herculean effort for everyone to get all aligned. I really welcome um, the, the government what I would consider accelerated interest in the progression of technology rollout, progression of full fiber rollout. Um, and, and one of the things that I think all the operators have pushed the, the government to do over the last couple of years is to look at how the government can remove the red tape, remove the barriers. And Clive is far more at the forefront of this and can, can, can articulate this much better than I can, but we've seen uh, a much more willingness on government and an understanding that the benefit to industry and to UK PLC, GDP, et cetera, is only going to be enhanced by a full fiber network rollout and next gen technology. But there are a number of bureaucratic red tape, site access, paperwork areas where the government has and needs to continue to break down those barriers and allow that speed of rollout to happen at a much faster pace than it's been happening. Sure. Clive, do you, do you do you want to add to that? I mean, are there, are there particular steps that you think uh, we need to take to accelerate the rollout of these technologies? Yeah, look, Ed, certainly in the full fiber space, I think the acceleration is there, you know, to witness. Um, we, we, we'll build two million homes past this year. We could, we'll, we'll do a bigger number than that next year. We continue to hire so that we've, well, you know, the army of people building fibre in the UK is expanding. You know, I have 12,000 people out there building fibre today, hired another 1,500 uh, this year. Uh, I've got big plans for expanding that workforce next year. So the acceleration is happening. Could the government help? Um, yes, they can, and uh, they do have a mind to do so. We, we, we would ask that it would be easier to get streetworks permission so that we can you know, close roads, uh, lay cables, um, uh, and then get out of that area having delivered full fiber. We would ask that it was easier to get access to apartment blocks in the UK. 15% of the UK population live in apartment blocks now, Robin, and it's often very difficult to get access to those blocks to lay cables um, up the risers and across the, uh, the landings so that those people can get access to full fibre. Um, we would ask that it were easier to get way leaves to put fibre cables across both public and private land. So there are some things that we would ask of government. Um, I know government are focused on some of these. There is legislation uh, in the construction phase, um, but we, we would love that to accelerate because um, this is all about just getting stuff out of the way, getting the blockers out of the way um, uh, and, and, and allowing our army of people to do their job, but do it quicker and more efficiently. Sure. And, and Robert, if, um, I could, if I could, if I could just add something to that, an important point I think that we've learned in the last sort of nine months with our, with our challenges around the COVID environment is the, the communications industry, the operators, the telcos, the, the technology vendors have all um, responded and moved uh, you know, out of the offices but kept the, the rollout going. What I, what I wouldn't like to see happen is government or anybody think 
that that comms industry is fine, doesn't need that additional help or the funding or the planning because then the effort needs to go into other areas. Sure it does in NHS, uh, industry rebuild, job creation, totally agree. But but to, to say everything went fine with comms, it, we, we, all, we all kept online, that industry is okay. It still needs that dedication. It still needs that, uh, that funding, that finance, that planning, that rural rollout. Um, it would be a mistake to say, oh, everything's okay there. Let, let's just leave it to itself. It still needs that push that was instigated before uh, uh, the, the COVID lockdown. Sure. I mean, we've heard a lot um, in recent uh, months about big infrastructure projects, which could potentially help kickstart, you know, uh, the economy uh, post COVID, we hear about HS2, for example, um, and, you know, the 89 billion pounds uh, cost. I mean, do you think that uh, digital infrastructure has um, enough of a profile in this debate? I mean, is, should we be focusing uh, on, on uh, these networks, on broadband, on 5G, above and beyond HS2? Should it have a higher priority uh, for, for government? Clive. Yeah, if I could, yeah, if I could have a go at that one, um, I think you're right, Robin. There is a danger that the 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 population at large don't fully acknowledge the value of fantastic world class digital infrastructure. Uh, you know, there's some research I've seen from the Centre for Economic and Business Research. It's an independent uh, 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 researcher says that if we fully fibred the UK, it would add 59 billion pounds per annum to the GDP of the country. Um, it would reduce commuting. It would take 300 million tonnes of carbon emissions out. It would enable you know, people with caring responsibilities to re-enter the workforce. The benefits, the societal and economic benefits of a massive full fibre deployment are extraordinary um, and it's it's my responsibility it's Cormac's responsibility it's, it's everyone in the industry has got to make that as clear as possible to government um, to regulators and to, to members of the public it is it, it is the 21st century version of the railroads right this is this is the infrastructure of the future um, and it actually the subsidies that it would take to get it rolled out very, very extensively are not that enormous when taken in the context of the HS2 investment. You know, government is talking about helping industry to roll out full fibre to rural UK to the tune of five billion pounds. Now, that's that's an order of magnitude less than HS2. And whilst I have nothing against the HS2 investment, um, I would use it to point out what fantastic value a fibre deployment would be for, for the country. In relative terms, um, it's a low cost and in benefit terms, it's massive. Sure. Cormac, any thoughts on that yourself? I uh, to totally agree. I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the year it was, but I think the year or the year before Clive um, took over his current role, there was a World Trade Organization stat that said in in uh, countries considering or already in the process of rolling out uh, faster broadband speeds, for every 100 megs added to a national speed, you increase GDP between 1 and 1.5%. 1 this is a long known economic benefit brought by the digital infrastructure. Probably not something we've thought enough about, uh, but certainly something that we should be taking into consideration in terms of the the medium to longer term planning for UK PLC, certainly. Um, and just uh, another question, perhaps for for uh, well for both of you, but first to first to Clive, um, is there a risk with uh, some of these networks that um, you know, as you, you yourself have pointed out, the um, the disparity in in service between rural and and urban. Britain, but um, mm -hmm. that we end up kind of exacerbating a, a digital divide between um, the countryside and, and our and our cities. That's a, a really important question, Robin. Um, it, you know, we talk about levelling up, don't we, between north and south. We should also talk about levelling up between uh, metropolitan and rural areas. Um, as as uh, Openreach deploys fibre, we are committed to what we term a balanced build. So we are building in proportion. 
in rural areas um, and in, in urban areas. Um, but I would say this, um, in order to get to all of rural UK, there are some areas in there that are very non-economic non for private companies to tackle. Um, so we do need to work hand in glove with government. Um, the government does need to launch its new rural full fibre or gigabit capable uh, network scheme, which will uh, utilise some government money to subsidise the tougher rural deployment. Um, I know they're working furiously on it, getting the scheme together, getting the details right, making sure it's a good scheme. Um, but we do need that launched as quickly as it can be in order that we can get on with the task of not just doing selective parts of rural UK, but also get out to the hardest to reach parts of the UK. Uh, and I'm sure, um, you know, the other thing that we must we must do is work on innovative technological approaches to rural, particularly ultra rural uh, broadband delivery. Um, you know, radio techniques, Cormac's business, um, you know, is a leader in that field, maybe satellite uh, based broadband services. You know, we need to look innovatively at how we can get very fast, very stable broadband services out to the toughest to reach parts of the rural UK, the, you know, the the mountainous areas, the the islands, um, and and the very you know, the moorlands where, where communities will benefit probably more even than uh, those in urban areas who already have fairly decent broadband. Sure. Yeah, t t totally agree. I mean, this is one of the questions of our age uh, in uh, in in comms. Um, you know it. it Network connectivity, being online, availability of fixed or mobile connectivity is now an expectation. It's now being added to all the the uh, hierarchy of needs charts. It's now expected, just like electricity, you hit a button, you've got a power life, you hit a button, you're online. Um, it, it, that's the ultimate dream of all of us. Um, there are some limiting factors, the physical uh, capability to actually roll out to every square foot of the country is a Herculean task is massive. Um, the cost of doing this, I mean, Clive touched on it. There is this expectation from everybody that by having the right to it, it should just be there. Uh, it should be provided by someone. But these are commercial enterprises. These these need to be giving a return on investment to, to businesses who invest in rolling out these things. Everybody wants to come in and roll out to cities and towns because there's a, there's a, a big enough population to take it up. But no one seems to want to come in and say, actually, yes, I want to do it to the remotest parts of the country. That's where the government have come in. There is funding. They have they got their O100 rural program in, in Scotland. They've got uh, Project Stratum in Northern Ireland. They have a Welsh program. So all these things are required with the funding, but there still needs to be a return on this for the government and for the companies involved in doing this. As Clive said, the one thing that has changed now is that with new generation technologies, fixed wireless access, 5G as it rolls out, these will provide us with greater capability to fill in those last remote, difficult, hard to access pieces. And I think that the, the future of this communications infrastructure will be fixed line broadband, it will be large scale IP and optical transmission networks, it will be 4G and 5G mobile networks, uh, fixed wireless access, Wi-Fi, and a whole hybrid of those in between that will allow us to now, uh, if you like, finally knit together that patchwork of communications to make sure everybody gets that high-speed connectivity. Sure. If I could just turn um, to the issue of, uh, of skills uh, and jobs um, uh, for a second. We, we had these pretty alarming figures uh, on youth unemployment uh, being at the highest level on yeah. record, which came out yesterday. Um, and these big infrastructure projects that we're talking about, you know, offer some hope that, that uh, particularly younger people can, can uh, get back into the workforce and get involved in and, and develop skills uh, for the future. Do, do, um, do UK companies have access to the right skills in order to build and maintain these, these new networks? Clive? Um, so our approach at OpenReach to, to this is simply to hire good people. Mostly they will not have the detailed telecommunication skills. So what we've done is established a network of training centres up and down the UK. We have 12 major sites across the UK, all of which have now been refitted over the last three years to make them 
um, suitable for training fiber skills. So, so what we do is hire. We hire locally in the various regions of the UK. We take the, the, the new hires into the training schools and we train them. We put them on, on our apprenticeship programs and we train them uh, using our own training resources, our own facilities. Uh, and they come out skilled as fiber construction people uh, and, and fiber operations people. Um, and that works. That works. In fact, the the you know the downside of the COVID period um, is not that you can't get people. You can get people. There are sadly um, higher unemployment stats. So getting good people is not the issue. Getting them skilled and trained is. Um, and in the current environment, our schools can take in fewer people than they were designed for uh, because of the social distancing rules. So the the classroom fill has had to be reduced in order to comply with the uh, with the very necessary safety regulations. Um, you know, I'm hoping with news of vaccines and so forth, um, some of those rules will um, will, will be relaxed, um, perhaps in the second half of 2021, uh, and we'll be able to um, you know get a, an even higher throughput of uh, skilled people through the training centres. Sure. I just wanted to um, uh, ask you, uh, offer a couple of questions from uh, our our, uh, our viewers. Um, sure. So, uh, and, and, and I'm conscious of time. So, uh, we've got one here from uh, Luke, who's saying the figures in, given indicate that fibre rollout will take 15 years. Uh, if this is so important for the UK economy, surely there's more that can be done to accelerate this. Uh, all we've heard so far is the need for better access to apartment blocks. Um, well, uh, I think I did articulate some barriers that could be removed, um, street works, apartment blocks, way leaves. There's a, there's a, you know, I could bore you with the full list. Look, look, the answer, Luke, is um, we could, we haven't got 15 years to get this done. We need to we need to crack this or or crack it almost uh, entirely within a sort of five six year period from now. Um, uh, I gave you a stat, 2 million homes this year. I think you've divided that into 30 and got 15 years. I won't be building 2 million next year. I'll be building a number that's a lot closer to three. Uh, and, you know, maybe the year after that, we'll, we'll, we'll go bigger again. Um, so we are accelerating the build and we are not the only company doing the build. There is, um, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole load of new network infrastructure companies out there um, that, like us, but typically on a slightly smaller scale, are building. Together, we've got to smash this in the next five years. Um, and, you know, I think we should uh, be confident that that is achievable. Um, to do that, we need these enablers from government that I've talked about. To do that, we need this subsidy scheme for the ultra rural areas of the UK. To do that, we need to hire and train uh, not just thousands, but it will be, you know, 10,000, 15,000 across the industry um, to increase the rate of deployment. Um, we, we can smash this in five years um if if we if we really go at it with purpose and we collaborate with government um to get to get the the environment right for very fast deployment so and Robin, if, just the, add, add to that. If, if, if you were to go if you were to go back as little as 18 months ago may, clive clive keep me honest here about 18 20 months ago the goal and aim for this country the ambition was full fiber deployment and capability by about 2033 but I think yeah. with the push from the operators, the push from the technologists and the engagement of government now seeing the economic benefits of this, there is now a much accelerated ambition level by 2025, the mid to late 20s, to get to a much, much higher dense capability way before what was the ambition as little as 18 months ago. So everyone is now coming here to ac accelerate this in line with the proposed economic benefits of this um, and, and pull it forward by as, as much as you know seven eight years which would be fantastic sure um we're, we're running out of time here so i just wanted to um ask a final question because uh to, to to you clive um obviously the, the the really big issue um around telco infrastructure uh this year or over the past few years has been uh, the question of huawei uh and um you know we finally got a, a decision on uh, restricting Huawei's role in 
uh, the UK networks um, earlier this year. I just wanted to ask whether uh, this is the right decision, you know, what the impact will be, and is it going to delay uh, the rollout of some of these networks? Okay, so, uh, you know, Huawei is a very capable network technology company. Um, lots of the operators have had a relationship with them for a long time. Um, but we have to go forward from where we are. And where we are um, in the UK is that the government have decided that they want to massively reduce the reliance on Huawei uh, and in some instances remove it entirely, right? Those are the circumstances we now operate in. The good news is that we're getting on with the job. Um, and we're working with, um, you know, Cormac's company, Nokia. Um, I'm working with others. Adtran would be another example, US company. Um, we are finding highly capable, highly competent um, Western companies, um, European companies, American companies. Um, we are, in our rollout, not losing a beat. Right as we as we switch the emphasis, um, um, so you know, don't look back, look forward. We have good, we have a great set of partners, including new partners, um, and, and we are going to crack the problem using those. Don't look back. Sure. Well, um, with that, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, thank both of you, uh, Cormac and Clive, uh, for everything. It was a really interesting session.